Um, I'm Carolina Cruzneira and uh, I'm the director of a research center in virtual reality called the Emerging Analytics Center and we are part of the University of Arkansas in Little Rock and a lot of people ask why are you in Little Rock, Arkansas doing something that is so much uh, technically advanced and, and modern and the reason for it is because uh, there is a tremendously good infrastructure here to do what I do and there is actually a lot of uh, energy and enthusiasm to support the work that I do and uh, the opportunities for us to do interesting projects and more unique things with less restrictions. Not, not so much legal restrictions, but almost intellectual restrictions, you know, because here there is almost nothing. So, so there is no preconceptions, there is no um, baggage of any kind, you know. There is no, things have to be done in a certain way. So to me, that's always been very exciting. You so know. it's new for everybody. It's new and, and, uh, and we are the cool group on the campus. You know, we're the exciting group on campus. And that for me is always a good thing. So, and, and this is not the first time in my career. I have always been in universities where you would not expect to have the kind of work that I do. And, and it's really, like I said, it's a lot more fun. It's harder too, because if we run into some complications, we don't have a lot of colleagues that we can talk to or, or, or an environment where there is a lot of knowledge on the area that we do research of. But at the same time, it's a lot of fun because like I said, we have no constraints of any kind on what we do. So you have to find out everything yourself. Or even to students? Pretty much, yeah, we're kind of uh, pioneering. pioneering to some extent. And uh, if we hit our head in the wall, we had to hit it and hit it and hit it until eventually we break the wall. Because, like I say, sometimes uh, we're entirely on our own in, in some situations. But at the same time, because we are the unique group in, in the campus and in many cases in the state that we are in, in the United States, then we get a lot of uh, support and we get a lot of encouragement and we get a lot of uh, positive uh, reactions to a lot of the things that we do. And, and also we give a lot back because around us, we are always generating other opportunities. So for example, uh, businesses that will not consider coming into Little Rock, they consider setting up here because we are here so for them having a relationship with my group might be very exciting and they were like oh we were not thinking of going to Arkansas we were thinking of maybe going to California or Boston or something like that but your group being there is is for us is actually wonderful because the cost of living is a lot lower the the ability for us to uh, financially support the company is is much much easier than in these other areas and at the same time they have we have the same intellectual quality on our relationship with a university so so it's a it's a mutually beneficial relationship for us to be in in an unexpected university <laughs> uh, but what exactly is your science what is all is my science? I don't know. A lot of people ask me that question and I'm not sure if I'm actually a scientist myself because I'm more trained from engineering and engineers were always sort of the weird scientists because we're always very practical. Um, so, so I think our science is more our ability to find uh, the root of a problem and find some ways to solve that problem or at least to make it better. So it might not be deeply, deeply theoretical, a lot of the things that we do, but they are deeply technically challenging, the things that we do. So sometimes it's a struggle because we might be doing something that is unique. Nobody has done it before. It's incredibly hard to solve the problem, but it might not feel that we just discover a new way of how the galaxies were formed, you know, or or some new philosophical theory of how our soul relates to the meta universe or something like that, you know. <laughs> so we are we are much more practical and down to a specific point that needs a solution. So um, But altogether 
what you do with virtual reality. What? That's, 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 well, you can have your <laughs> the theories about it as well. So. Yes, I have my theories and, and myself personally, I think throughout my entire career, I have been a little bit of an outsider to the virtual reality science community because I always thought very differently than the main trend of thoughts. If, if, even today, you know, if you talk about virtual reality today, when somebody says, uh, do you know what virtual reality is about? Immediately they're going to identify with putting some sort of goggles on your face and look around some beautiful landscape or something like that. That's not exactly what I do, because to me, virtual reality is the ability to create some world in the computer that, again, solves a problem. And in order to do that, sometimes you have to be multiple people sharing the environment with their own bodies, not, not through virtual representation of myself in the world, but actually myself physically embedded in the virtual world. So I want to see your face and your face and your face while I'm seeing the virtual world. So my work is more about building large Can space. Can you try to explain that <laughs> again? I think I understand, but... but... Well, when, when, again, when you talk about virtual reality with the majority of the community out yeah, that there... That part I did understand, but, but the, the part you say... With the body? How, 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 what you do in virtual What reality. I do. Here, I'm going to tell you what happened to me when I first saw virtual reality. Let's go back to the beginning. You know, when I first saw virtual reality in 1991, I had the same experience everybody's having today. You know, the, somebody put some goggles on my face and I started looking around some beautiful world. And of course, I was a young student at the time. I never seen it before. So what did I do? Same as everybody does today. Wow. You know, but like with everything else, after that is over, the, the excitement is over, then you start thinking, what is this thing really? What is it, this thing? You know, what, what does, and again, I'm thinking as an engineer, what is this thing doing for me? Other than just, wow. So when I start thinking that, um, first of all, I was, you know, I'm not myself anymore here. Because when I'm in, 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 right here in this room with you, I see my hands, I see my legs, I see a little bit of my hair in here. When I put goggles, I lost all that immediately. I'm not myself anymore. I don't know how big something is. I don't know how close something is because I can tell this table is here because I can see my hand going towards that table. So that gives me a sense of a space and relationship. In the virtual world, I'm trying to grab something, but I don't see anything. At the most, I see some floating hand that is not connected to my body and is not even my own hand because most of the virtual environments, they give you a male hand, you know, and I'm a woman, I have my little red nails and all that, so it's not even my hand. So I lose myself the moment I work in the virtual space. That's number one. Number two, as humans, we like to talk to people. We are very social individuals. We're a very social, I don't know, Animal, I put my goggles on, I lost all of you as well. Because I might be seeing something and I might be saying, look at that. You don't see it because you don't have the goggles on. So what, what I see, you don't see it. There's no way for me to share that with you in, a, in, a, in the same way I share this room with you. So to me, those, those kinds of things, since I was very, very, very young, were very annoying about the way virtual reality was being approached by, uh, in general, by the research community. So, so I, I thought about what can be done to bring myself into the virtual space. What can I do to do that? And I was very fortunate because I was starting my PhD and the professor that I was working with gave me a lot of freedom to explore whatever I wanted to do. He had some set ideas of what he wanted to do. Um, and I, was, I started doing what he wanted me to do, but at the same time, in parallel, I started experimenting with some of the things that I was interested on. And down the line, the, the professor was, uh, I guess, gracious enough to recognize that the direction that I was going was exciting, and he let me run with those ideas. 
So I ended up developing, uh, in a sense, a goggle big enough that it was the size of a room. So oh, instead okay. of putting it on so your head, yeah, I built the cave. So, uh, so it was a room. I'm still in use today, you know, 20 something years <laughs> later. So, so you walk into this room. So because your body comes with you into the virtual environment, your friends come with you into the virtual environment. And you'll see that tomorrow when we go to the laboratory, you know, so you come with me and then I will be saying, look at that. And you see my finger pointing at a virtual object the same way I say, look at this table or something like that. So that social element is part of the virtual experience without any recreation virtually of yourself, which is what people do these days. When you do a, a shared virtual environment, they recreate yourself in the virtual environment, but, but that's not you. Yeah. That's a puppet that represents you or an avatar, that's I guess the right term. So, so for me, like I said, since I did that back in 1991, you know, everybody's going this way in virtual reality and I'm going that way. <laughs> so that has been always a little bit challenging uh, to be. But with a lot of success. It was, it, well, it, that's what I mentioned earlier, you know, I have been very, very successful on what I have done, but not necessarily my work has been always been recognized as science because it doesn't feed the pattern or the mold that the, that the community is, the majority of the community is going. But at the same time, the work that I have done has had a significant impact in industry. Uh, today, uh, a lot of the car companies, for example, have caves at different stages of the design and manufacturing of cars. Um, the oil industry uses uh, variations of the cave, not the cave as it was originally created, but but this concept of having large spaces that you uh, share uh, the immersive space and, and many others, you know, for training and, and in many other aspects. It's not, it's not a commodity or a consumer product. And, no, no, you know, it's not something that you can have in your home, obviously. But, but it's been incredibly uh, successful. The, the, another industry that uses this quite a lot and is not very well known in the press is the mining industry for safety training, okay. planning, planning, uh, you know, as you know, underground mines are extremely complex and, and have a lot of uh, safety issues. So that industry uses caves in around the I world. Once filmed in uh, Norway, uh, the Rolls Royce uh, Marine, mm -hmm. and they, they built uh, ca cabins from, uh, uh, from the ship, where they steer the ship. And they had windows all around it, mm -hmm. all with projections of the sea. Yeah. So when you were in there, it was in the office, just not at the sea. Yeah, so it, those are the marine trainers, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and even the sea went like this, and I mm -hmm. got seasick. Yeah. And I think that's the main, perhaps, scientific contribution, if you want to call it that way, of this work, because it, in a sense, it opened the minds of many people that for maybe 10, 15 years were thinking virtual reality was a particular platform and my world opened the mind to say virtual reality is a concept and that concept can be uh, realized in a variety of platforms and it's not a one platform is the solution. There are different problems. So that depending on the problem, a cave is a good platform. For some other problems, the head mounted displays is a good platform. But some other problems, uh, you'll see it in the lab, other kind of platforms are more appropriate. But if, you, if we visit your lab, or I'm a, a, suppose I'm a student and I want to go study with you, uh, what exactly uh, is, is what I'm going to learn? What, what reason could I study <laughs> uh, uh, with you? Well, I think that you asked me that question maybe four years ago when virtual reality was not popular. Uh, the answer would be, different today virtual reality is very popular again it was very popular in the 90s and then it went silent and now it's popular again and i think the 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 reason to do it is is i guess some some students that come and study with me they just think that if they do something related to virtual reality and in particularly if they work with me because of my name recognition then they'll get a very good job and they'll make a lot of money. 
So, so those kind of students, to be honest with you, I don't want those students in my lab. And uh, we have learned very quickly to spot those students because they don't really care about the work. They care that they, in their minds, they think, oh, I'm doing something that is trendy, that is uh, innovative. And, and just because I'm doing it and just because I'm doing it with Dr. Cruz, you know, I'm just going to graduate and I'm just going to get this yeah. very high paying job. But from, from experience, yeah, they are very opportunistic and they don't really care about what they are doing. They care about making money at the end well, of the what day. What do you care about? So we care about our students when they come to us and they say, um, can I work with you because I have this idea. And I think uh, with your guidance, I could explore this idea and see where it takes us. So that's an example of a student that we like to find those kinds of students because that's how I was. You know, I was doing something, nobody had done it before. And I had a professor that, uh, for one reason or another, decided to let me run with but, it, you know. But maybe when we start at the beginning, just for, for, the, uh, for our uh, understanding, can you explain to me, and, uh, and uh, I know nothing, <laughs> what, is, what is virtual what reality? What is virtual reality? Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> Uh, the way I normally explain to people is just um, a way to create worlds with the computer. Now, for me, there is very little difference uh, between virtual reality and augmented reality. There are two fields, and when you talk to different professionals, there will be people that will be very, very adamant that is two completely different disciplines. You know, you do virtual reality, you know nothing at about augmented reality and so on. There are some other groups and I'm part of those groups where I think both of them have a lot of common uh, base uh, concepts. And the difference is with virtual reality, you create worlds that are entirely in the computer. They don't necessarily have any relationship to the real world or to the reality that you find yourself in that particular moment. So you can be tiny, 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 tiny and explore the world at the atomic level, or you can be huge and explore at the universe level. You can travel worlds that never existed. You can go back in time. You can go into the future. So basically, whatever your imagination conceives, you can generate that inside the computer and then put yourself inside that world. And, and, and uh, um, what's the difference with the, with the real world? Because when you enter a virtual world, why isn't that real? Well, and that's a very good question. For uh, many of the worlds that we do, they actually become very real to the people that experience those worlds. There is something that we study that is called the sense of presence. So how, how much those virtual worlds make you, in a sense, forget that they are virtual and you suddenly became so involved, so engaged on that world that that world becomes real. So you forget that you're in my lab or that you are inside a company or something like that and you completely get mentally and almost physically transported to that new reality, whatever it is, you know. So, so and that's what we want to do sometimes. We really want you to feel that those places are real. Whether you're there for five minutes or three hours, that you disconnect yourselves from the real world. Sometimes are very disoriented because we make worlds that intentionally don't behave like with the laws of physics as the real world does. And it's very interesting sometimes to see people uh, adjusting <laughs> to those worlds, you know, because the, something like, for example, Escher, you know, you've seen the, the paintings of Escher, that you have a stair that is going up and then suddenly you're going downstairs and you don't even know how that happens. So we, we have built some worlds like that, that you suddenly, the laws of physics don't work, but people become very functional. They just, it's like they always did that. It, it makes a lot of sense that you're going up the stairs and suddenly you end up in the basement. You know, you go upstairs to go to the basement, it's just normal, you know. So it's, to me, all these kinds of things are really exciting. Uh, of course, sometimes... But then that's, that's real as well, right? On, on that particular moment, on that particular time frame that you are in the space, it might become very real. We have people that are afraid sometimes to move in the virtual space 
because we have um, our floor is also virtual. So sometimes we might be very high up on a ledge of something. Or maybe one of the the projects that we have right now has one of those old rope and uh, boards, bridges that you have to cross between two very high mountains. And we have people that they don't want to cross that bridge because they are afraid of heights. Do so you, do it, you? Me? Personally, no. <laughs> no. You don't have to do that? No, no. It's, it's, uh, for, for me, it's, it's sometimes because it's, I've been doing this for so long, sometimes it's hard for me to disconnect myself from the real reality. So I know, I know in a sense it's not real, uh, fake to some extent. So no, I can, I walk in water or I walk oh, in the air. Yeah, and, and I don't feel any, any inhibitions, yes. But, but we do have a lot of people that think twice before they go through the, through that. Or, or again, uh, we might have a balcony that doesn't have any railing. You know, a lot of people will not, they do that a step to get out of the balcony, which nothing is gonna happen. I mean, they're just gonna, they're on, they're on solid ground, but virtually they are not on solid ground. So, so we have people that even if we push them a little bit gently, say, give it a try, give it a try. No, 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 no. So, so it becomes for, it becomes very, very real and people do, um, they have this strange dual confusion in their heads. They know it's not real, but they behave like this real. So it's a very interesting. So what, what's the purpose of, of putting people in that, that kind of environment into a computer? What? Because if they have to get used to it, so they think, oh, it's, it's not real. So I can move on that bridge or that balcony or. Uh... Well, again, like I told you at the beginning, we solve problems virtual reality so uh, one very typical problem that we're solving all the time is different types of training yeah that's very practical i understand that but uh, but somehow um, the, the, with virtual reality we can also uh, um, live in another world yes mm -hmm. or uh, or um, think about our own virtual identity Yes, and, and it's, also, uh, it's also a way to sometimes communicate your understanding of the world to others. For example, we have worked with patients that have brain damage that has changed the way they perceive the world and how they, um, how they function. You know, for, for us, it's very easy to we look at this table and we know immediately it's a table. You know, for people that have some kind of brain damage through accidents or some disease or something, they look at the table and they cannot recognize that this is a table, for example, you know. So so sometimes they, their behavior feels erratic, but it's not erratic because they find themselves in situations that they just, something as simple as a table, they, their brain doesn't process that. So, so we have worked with some patients um, a few years back where through their verbal descriptions of how they perceive the world, we try to recreate virtual environments that we could become that person and we could understand how that person perceives the world and mm. and why that person has a panic attack when there's a tree on the path because it does not recognize that as a tree you know so those kinds of things is and then you can solve that problem yeah, yeah you can help people to understand your reality in a sense in a way you know and again you can also create a completely new reality that we don't know what it is at this moment you know that you might imagine and build it and and make an experience i have a good colleague that his sort of perspective is that virtual reality allows you to be not only somebody else but something else so he always gives the example he always wanted to be a lobster so <laughs> you know so he's he like one of his first virtual reality applications over 20 something years ago was to understand the world from the perspective of a lobster and you use virtual reality and become a lobster, you know? So um, that's not really my my area of work. It's more, like I said, more from a practical perspective of how do we solve yeah. a problem, you know? But certainly, you know, if you wanna feel the world, like if let's say you were some sort of bacteria, how do bacteria understand the world and how do we spread themselves through 
another organism, well, you can use virtual reality and become a bacteria and, and live in the world of microorganisms and see how that world uh But that's all very behaves. practical, I can understand that. But if you, if you try to, to, to look at the borders of, of your science, uh, what's possible right now, but what we can expect in the future, uh, that the, of this virtual world will become so real, or, or am I wrong? Well, yeah. What, 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 when you try to, uh, 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 to think about it, uh, not in a practical way, but in a way, uh, in the direction we're going with this, uh, these developments. Yeah, and, and I think there is a little bit of, um, like with every new science, there is always the positive part that the science brings to society and some of the potential uh, dangers that can bring into society. And, and certainly there is a, a concern that we might create some realities that become much more pleasant, much more um, rewarding or satisfactory that the real reality, especially in the world that we live today, that there's so many frustrations. You know, we all have a lot of frustrations in our daily life. And then you can go into virtual reality and you can be, um, I don't know, some very wealthy person with a beautiful virtual yacht going to some beautiful virtual island that, you know, not your small, tiny basement apartment that you can barely pay the rent, you know. So, so there is certainly a concern and, and it's a growing concern that we might in the long term, in the long term future, not not in the next maybe five years, but really looking far into the future that we might create this alternate reality to some extent that is better than our real reality. And we might all start living more those alternate realities versus the, the, the real life or something. And how are we going to handle that? And that at this moment, we are, I think, so early on what we are doing that I don't think none of us has a very good, um, I don't know how to say, understanding or picture of how all this is going to happen. Because right now with the technology that we have, I am personally convinced that will never really happen because the technology is still... It will never happen. The, the, the with with what, the know. way we have it right now. We, yeah, we okay, haven't... But you, but you know it's, it's going to develop. We haven't, I don't think we have found the the right solution at all yet all the platforms that we have right now and I'm, I'm right right now i'm talking about physical platforms you know all the different helmets all the different projectors all the different all these things that we have um they are not like transparent they, they you know it, it takes a conscious effort to to put them on you have to have uh, a specific uh technology, computers, this, that, you know, it's not comfortable. It doesn't fit well on your head. It crashes, it, you know, all those kinds of things. So, so it is a good novelty, but I think that as we move forward, people will like all the novelties, you know, and in a couple of years, everybody will come down and then everybody's going to have their virtual reality set at the bottom of the drawer, like has happened with some of the gaming technologies that, you know, they you were... think so? That will happen? I again with the current platforms as we have them today, I think so because again there were some gaming platforms which I'm not gonna mention but that, is all that they were gonna change ago. they were gonna change the world a yeah. few years ago and what happened yes it was a great innovation but who wants to spend three four five six hours playing a video game standing on your feet yeah. you know it was a really good platform but that, that's tw twenty years ago <laughs> but, but in the future. I can imagine that this virtual reality becomes so real or so perfect or without any bugs because in real life we can also get sick or we yes. can, can uh, 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 crash to another car. Yeah, and that's what I say with the technology that we have today, no, but in the direction that we're going, whatever might come down the line, you know, that is certainly a concern. And there are starting to be around the world movements related to ethics and the use of virtual reality. So there are some, you know, committees and groups and that are starting, there is some here in the US, there are some in Europe that are starting to appear, there are some in Asia where at this moment are being more kind of like uh, coffee shop conversations, you know, a small group, but, but, it's in, but they are starting to appear because there is, there is a concern. Now, at the same time, 
is is it a concern to say hey we should stop doing what we're doing and not do it anymore i don't think so because no, the the benefits are so much and 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 at so many levels that i think this is something that is more education you know like drugs you know do everybody knows that drugs are bad but there are people that are still taking drugs you know well that's their own responsibility to make that decision so but well, at I this think in every science and every development there is a there's science, always something uh, like that uh, should we do this or not but uh, but on the other hand you know it's also good because we also have done some work related to stress and depression and and again creating this alternate reality that for a short period of time you become again some person whatever is your fantasy you know a very famous singer a very wealthy person a famous explorer going somewhere you know a lobster you know <laughs> whatever your yeah. fantasy is you know just just 10 15 minutes exposure to that type of alternate reality significantly decrease, decreases stress levels and depressions and that has been demonstrated by not only my group and other groups, you know, well, that we I have. I believe it. that um, because I would like to, of course, there's a discussion on ethics and that's in every, every science, but uh, since that discussion will, will be there or come uh, anywhere, uh, but if we explore that path of development into in virtual reality, um, it seems to me that. Uh, uh, In the future, you can have more identity than only your own real identity. Mm -hmm. So you become, um, and it's not about ethics or something, but but uh, how, how will that, that look like? Suppose we're, we're it's two thousand and fifty, and we we have more we have, we have more than our own real identity. But we have that today. I mean. Look at what people are doing in Facebook. Are, are, is it you in Facebook? It's not really you. I mean, you are the one doing the postings, but you are, you are in a sense, you know, maybe exaggerating some of your postings, uh, not necessarily lying, but embellishing <laughs> the situation. So, so we already, to some extent, are using some technologies that are giving us multiple personalities or multiple identities. You know, uh, you see a lot of, discussions on how people represent themselves in chat rooms and in Twitter and some other things like that. So I think at that level, of course, with virtual reality is much more powerful because it's not just uh, your, let's say, posting a picture and say, oh, look, big deal about this, you know, but it's actually living that experience that you're actually creating or something like that. So. Um, I don't know. I, personally, that's something that doesn't worry me too much because, again, the benefits are really what I'm focused on. No, it's not about you worries. Know? Not at all. It's more like I try to, to have a, a, an image of how the future will look like. I don't know. With me having uh, other, uh, other identi uh, identities. Well, I'm, I'm curious. Uh, we, might, we might be, uh, in many ways, maybe happier and healthier because, you know, as we're getting older, for example, you know, we don't have as much energy as we used to have. But when one, one, my, one of my identities can be a very energetic woman that can still go and, you know, dance on point shoes, which I haven't danced in over 30 years now, you know, but, you know, I can still virtually maybe do that, you know, maybe your other identities that you used to go and swim, you know, 10 kilometers or something, you know, across some straight somewhere and you cannot do that right now, but that virtual reality might allow you to do it, you know. So I think it's it's. What will that do to us if we have those choices in virtual reality? Uh, <laughs> well, we're also going to have life is going to change too because again, uh, some of the things that virtual reality helps, like any other again new technologies too. I think uh, the way we work is going to change. So, as we are all having more. Uh, Right now we're in a, in a strange, in my opinion, transition technology era where we are having a lot of technologies that make our jobs easier, but at the same time, they're giving us more work. You know, like for example, email. Email has facilitated communications tremendously, but at the same time, 
or communicating a lot more. So, so we can never clear that inbox queue. We're always busy trying to clear our email, you know, so we communicate so much now that it's keeping us busier. But again, looking into the future, many of these things get resolved and that translates into us having other time that we can use for more quality time or something else. I mean, so I think maybe in the future, virtual reality is going to help us to do our normal everyday work life easier in some ways, you know, like we have worked with companies, for example, that in the last 10 years, their, their, their time frame from the concept of a product to the product being in the market was in the, in between seven and nine years period with the introduction of virtual reality, doing virtual testing, virtual prototyping, bringing customers on the virtual stages of the product and all that their cycle now has reduced to about two years. So that, that has released a lot of the people in that company, a tremendous amount of work that they can use for something else, you know? So I don't know, it's a hard to imagine future, but at the same time, I think it could potentially be, um, a more relaxed, um, future, maybe a happier, uh, future, because again, it's, it's a few minutes of escaping, being, doing, you know, I love the ocean and we don't live by the ocean. We live in the middle of Arkansas right now, you know, so it would be great if I could spend 30 minutes every day sitting by the ocean and feeling the, the breeze, you know, that alone will just, I'll be happy for the rest of the afternoon, you know, or something like that versus kind of here, like it's hot and humid and it's been six months since I've seen the ocean or something like that. You know, I don't know. I think, um, do you still have to, 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 to do things when you have virtual? Well, of course, identities? of course, because what, what, is, what is left? What, you, what do you have to do yourself? Well, same as when you do in life. I mean, the, the, the virtual reality is not a passive reality. It's an active reality. So, so in real life, you don't sit on a chair and stare at the ceiling. <laughs> you, you have to do things, you know, you have to open a can of Coke. You have to turn on the lights. Uh, you have to look at the window. Uh, you have to do something. Do if, you, you, if you live in a virtual world, maybe you neglect yourself. I don't know. No. If you get to drink or... Uh, no. no. Oh, you mean neglect your physical yeah. needs. Uh, yes. That's a good point. Yes. You might, I don't know, it would be, I don't think anybody has done any size on that, but, in, but I'm, I'm assuming the physical part of your body, you know, the, the sensation of being hungry or, or thirsty or wanting to go to the restroom or something like that would probably still uh, kick in. I mean, I don't, I don't think the, the virtual reality will override some of our basic survival instincts or something like that. I, I would be surprised if that happens. You know, we talk about sensory substitution, but I don't think that you can do a virtual space so real and so exciting that you don't feel hungry or something like that. You know, I don't know. But, but you can imagine that you have a, 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 another right reality that you go to a restaurant and eat a lot of food and not get fat. Uh, yeah, but I don't know. But still, there is the... I mean, there are... There are uh, well, if it's possible, it will happen. There are, there are groups that are actually developing uh, virtual taste and virtual smells, you know, so potentially, yes, so potentially you might be on the virtual environment and just have virtual taste of the food and actually not being eating anything. But I still think that there is some primordial basic survival instance that sooner or later your stomach is going to be like, okay, this virtual taste is delicious, but my tummy still has not received Anything in there. <laughs> so, what's the difference then between the, the, uh, the, our own reality and virtual reality and our, our instincts? Well, what's the difference? Why, why, cannot, why can't we fake our instincts? I think that we can fake a lot. Like I told you, we, we get people uh, that they will not walk off a balcony in the virtual environment. You know, so that's a, that's a survival instinct that it, the virtual environment actually well, that's one triggers. That's get used to because we know we don't really fall down, so it's just a trick. And if you know the trick, 
then you can walk yeah. on the balcony. Well, again, it depends on how real is real, the virtual world, you know, because we can make you fall down and we can bang, we can hit you pretty hard if, you know, we can put you on a motion platform or put you in some kind of device that actually makes you feel the fall and actually hurt yourself if, if we want to go to that level. So in my lab, we don't do that right now, you know, <laughs> but, but in previous locations that I was before, we actually had uh, robotic type of systems that were around your body that as, as you were uh, interacting in the virtual space, the robotics were giving you physical feedback of the world, you know, so in those... Physical feedback, that's mm -hmm. uh, nicely said. Yeah, so, so you, yeah, so you could actually touch a virtual object and feel, or you could grab something and feel the weight of that virtual object. So, again, depending on how real is real, you can actually make it happen. But assuming, again, with the technology that we have today, you know, there are some, some instincts that, again, uh, we trigger. We don't necessarily intentionally do it when we build the worlds, but we observe that when we have people testing our our spaces, you know. So sometimes we don't realize something and then uh, when we have people in our virtual spaces, we notice things and we're like, whoa, we didn't think about that one, you know. Because like I said earlier, there's a lot of things we don't know yet. We don't understand yet what this technology really does to our head, you know. But, but, but that's, of course, that's what interests me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, because we, we try to explore the, the, the borders of, of science and what's, what's, what, what is there in the future waiting, waiting for us. And, and, and if, you, if you continue the way it goes like this with the development of virtual reality, you can imagine that you have realities which are so real and where you, where, where you can live in or you can create <coughs> a new identities for yourself, that, um, that, that, that it, uh, it becomes a, a kind of mix of reality. What, what is still real and what is not? So but, but there, at some point, virtual reality becomes a real reality. And they might become, for, for, for you or for me or for other people, the reality that you prefer to be versus the real reality, you know, and, and as you know, that has been around in science fiction for a long time, you know, I mean, there are, uh, for example, Asimov has a few novels where, where it's, a, it's a society in which humans don't want to have face-to-face uh, -face contact anymore because they prefer the virtual contact, you know, it's, it's to them almost the physical contact is almost uh, repulsive, they don't want to do that anymore, you know. So, so certainly, like I said earlier, you know, if we want to think on the, you know, pessimistic, extreme side of things, you know, maybe we can go that way. But, but again, thinking well, on, a, on, a, <laughs> on a positive way, it's, yeah, you know, hey, if, you're, if your virtual reality makes you a better person, makes you enjoy your life better, um, then... Live on it. What's what's the big deal about it? You know, so I don't know. Suppose, suppose <laughs> uh, I uh, I have another. Uh, I have a virtual identity which which I like, um, and I create that identity myself, right? Mm -hmm. Is it is it logical to think that any virtual virtual identity I, that I created myself, or is it also possible that my identity is will be influenced? By other elements or other people, um, do we have control? I think. Do I, I have control again, about my own virtual identity? Uh, my personal opinion is probably yes, because again, it's it's an identity that you are creating it digitally in a computer, so you can decide how much you let others to influence your identity versus you have full control of your identity. Again, at a very simplistic level. You know, look at people doing social media. You know, some of us share everything with the entire world and we let the world sort of, in a sense, influence our uh, how we appear to the world in our social media. And some of us have a lot of restrictions where we have a very limited group of people that can influence our conversations. And, and in that way, maybe we don't necessarily are informed of everything else that happens because we don't do it. So that's a simplistic level but again it's it's a digital reality 
So, yeah, this, so you can define so, in the future, you could say, you know, I want to be a virtual hermit. So my reality is mine and mine alone. And I just don't want anybody else to uh, so distort like it or close, close to some extent, you know, or, you know, hey, I have a really cool reality and I want to share that with my friends or with the rest of the world, you know, and let us see how this where this goes, you know, make because I let other people uh, evolve it with me and see where this thing takes us. So I think everything at this moment is an open uh, possibility. Again, mediated by the the again thinking as an engineer, mediated by how we build the tools and the systems and the platforms and all those kinds of things to make these things happen. Because today is not possible. Uh, a normal, let's say, an average person that is not at the level of uh, technology development that we have and other people around the world has, you know, they cannot do that right now. No. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not very easy to create these realities right now. You have to have a certain training to be able to do it, you know. But you know that it will be possible in the future. In a very far future, yes. So now everybody has a computer, but there were days that that people thought, well, computers are only for experts or for companies. Yeah, well, uh, if I can digress for a moment, I'm going to talk about a little bit what you're mentioning right now, because that's something that right now is uh, a very big concern of mine, a personal concern that I have. What, what, what is? Which is the, the fact that many people today, they think they are virtual reality developer experts, you know, because... Everybody today, as you say, has a computer because gaming industry has proliferated very rapidly. Everybody has a fairly good computer at home that can do pretty good uh, graphics, pretty good uh, uh, animations and those kinds of things, you know. So there are some tools out there that are open source or free license tools that people can get their hands on this uh, very easily. And now suddenly we're seeing all these virtual reality experts popping up everywhere because they think that because they grab the tool, they do a few pretty 3D models and they put it on Google Cardboard, for example, you know, suddenly, oh, I'm the big virtual reality expert. Well, I, this is something that is a big frustration of mine because this is, is not part of the development? The there is many other things behind that, you know, because, I mean, you guys are producing a documentary, so you know that everybody nowadays can get a digital camera. Mm -hmm. But am I going to produce a documentary at the level of quality that you're going to do it? No, because, you know, I the fact that I can get the camera, shoot at somebody's face and hold it still, that doesn't mean, that doesn't make me a good director, you know, because there is all the lights, there is the questions that you're making me and, and the experience that we all have. The same thing happens in virtual reality. Yeah, you can get the tool, but do you know what your technical parameters are? You know, Isn't it necessary that, that these developments also have... have uh, uh... Oh, absolutely. I mean, for example, if, if you generate a world um, there is a certain speed at which that world needs to be presented to the user. Otherwise, the user, plain and simple, is going to get really, really, really sick right off the bat. Now, many, many people don't understand that. They just start putting 3D worlds in there and 3D models and all that. They have a horrible performance. They are not even synchronized. One eye is going this way, the other eye is going that way, you know. And, and my issue is that that's, those kinds of applications sometimes are the first virtual reality experience for many people. And we are starting to see more and more people coming in our uh, laboratory saying, oh, no, no, I don't want to try it. Thank you. I already tried virtual reality and it made me very, very sick. You know, so there's this immediate rejection. And I'm like, well, you know, I'm not a high school kid that just got my hands on some free license, something and slapped together a pretty model. You know, we have been doing this very scientifically, very consciously with all the right approach and constraints and, and years and years of experience. So please try it. No, 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 no. 
And, and that is unfortunately happening more and more and more. And all these other things that we've been talking about will not happen if this other thing continues proliferating. Because if the experiences that people have are negative experiences, there's going to be rejection. And that happened back in the 90s. So, can you tell me again what time are we living in? Yes. So, I was mentioning to you that uh, I do uh, talk a lot about, around the world about what I do and also my vision of what I think virtual reality is going to go. And I, I'm pretty convinced that we're living in one of those uh, human history changing times you know that right now we don't see it because we're leaving it but i think generations into the future you know maybe 200 years from now 300 years from now people might be referring to this time as the virtual reality revolution like the industrial revolution and the information revolution i think we are at a point that what we are doing i think is going to change uh, our world as we know it it's going to change uh, how we live as humans and how I, we identify ourselves as humans. And of course, we don't know it because we're living it right now. But I, again, I'm, I'm pretty convinced that, you know, we won't see it, but in a few year, hundred years or no, we'll be on the textbooks and say, you know, the, the 2015s, the 2020s was the peak of the virtual reality revolution where all this was happening, you know. Um, it's hard, like always, to imagine how the future is going to look like. But again, it's, I think it's... Can you give it a try for me? I can give it a try. I so suppose in 200 years, there you are. There we are. I think... Um, what are you doing? Me, uh, I'm doing a lot of things. I mean, right now, the, the, there's a lot of things that I cannot do, uh, either because of physical limitations. Uh, I, I mean that. Suppose yep. you're 200 years, what are you doing? What, what I might be doing? Well, you know, I would be right now and saying, you know, it's super hot at this particular moment and I really want to go to the beach. So I'll see you there in five seconds, you know, and I'm going to go. I'm going to go in the beach. I'm going to get the cool breeze of the ocean. I'm going to smell the beautiful salty air and I'm going to forget about all this fogginess and humidity of July in Arkansas for whatever time I'm in there. Um, my child might decide that uh, he wants to go to some amusement park, but I don't have the time to physically take him there, or maybe we don't have the, the finances to go there, but my son might say, okay, mommy, I'm just gonna go uh, and visit this amusement park for the next uh, two hours, so don't bother me, <laughs> you know? So I think that's, that's an example, or uh, my car just broke down and I have no idea how to fix this car, you know, but I'm just going to go into some reality that is just going to somehow help me fix that car and get it better, you know, or, or since I cannot go with my real car, then I'm going to go into some virtual reality where I'm going to go where I was going to go, but I cannot go, you know. So I think that it's going to be... Um, you know, I tend to tell I tend to tell people that the, what we can do with virtual reality, our limits is our imaginations, and I think right now our imagination is still very constrained by real life. So it's very hard to imagine a world that is not physically constrained. You know, and it might not be my generation; it might be the next generation after us that actually has a much more free mind to imagine. Because I think right now we're so tangled on developing the technology that we have not freed up our mind yet or what this thing really can do. But again, the ability to go there, whatever that there is, uh, it just opens, uh, again, a, a time in human history that, that is completely different from everything else that we have right now. That sounds very exciting. Uh, to me, it's very exciting. You know, here I am, I've been doing this uh, since I was a young student and people say, hey, don't you get bored? And I'm like, no, because you know, as a difference, for example, with, let's say, um, maybe a biologist that spends his or her entire career looking for a particular drug to cure a disease, you know, I have spent my entire life in hundreds, thousands of different realities, experiences, worlds. I've seen things that I've never seen before. I've been in places that I cannot be otherwise. You know, I've been in 15th century India, for example, and I have participated in some religious ritual that doesn't happen anymore in real life. You know, we have been into the future 
and trying to figure out how life in Mars is going to be. You know, I have traveled through galaxies. I had gone down inside a, a plant cell and I actually traveled inside a water molecule and see photosynthesis from the inside. You know, uh, do I get bored? No, I don't. Because I live many, many lives and I experience worlds that don't exist in, in a way. And I experience worlds that exist, but I cannot physically experience them. You know, so to me, it's really cool. It's really exciting. You know, and like I say, what are we going to do 100 years from now, 200 years from now? I don't know. I mean, it's, it's hard to imagine because, again, could you imagine riding a water molecule and follow the water molecule inside a plant cell? You couldn't imagine that. Well, we've done it, you know, and, and we've done that routinely in our lab, for example, you know. So, so how to think beyond that? It's sometimes it feels like I haven't broken my iron chains here yet, you know. Um, but we're trying. <laughs> well, that's 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 a promising thought that that we now learn the techniques, but we don't. We have uh, after that we will use our imagination. Uh, what's possible with those new techniques? Yeah, and to me that's what is exciting to see the little ones. You know, um, we I have a six-year-old son, and to me. Sometimes watching him in virtual reality opens my own mind sometimes, you know, because his mind is not constrained as my mind is. Because we have right now, I think we have four generations concurrently living as, as it relates not only to virtual reality, but to technology in general. And again, it's a unique time in history because, you know, all the issues related to health and quality of life have been are the best in human history. So now we have people that are living well into their 80s and 90s having a perfectly functional life. So we have elderly people that have been their entire life without technology and now in their 60s, 70s, 80s are facing technology. So so when you put those people in virtual reality is is my best way to describe it is just adorable. It's just adorable <laughs> because they just like, they just sit there and they're like, oh, oh. <laughs> and they just, um, they just don't, they cannot even comprehend what it is that they're looking at. You know, they're very afraid of moving. They just kind of look around and they're like, thank you, dear. But that's it, you know. Then you get people like us, you know, the next sort of group of people where technology came when we are already professionals, very young professionals. So we have to develop our professional life with this technology around us. So I think we are the tinkerers because we are the ones that were like, how this thing works, you know, what can I do with this thing? You know, so, so for us, the mystery is not so much on more of the, the vision of what this thing is going to do for the life of the humans. For us, the mystery is what's under the hood and how this thing works, you know. And that's really what my generation is really focused on. Then there's the next generation, which is the people that are now maybe in their 20s or so, you know. And, that, and this technology came to them when they were kids, but older kids, like teenagers or so. So for them, it was kind of like, ah, oh, there it is, I have it, whatever. You know, I'm texting, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. It's cool, I can play video games, I can do this. So for them, it's, it's something that is a cool factor. And then you had little ones that are being born into this. And like my son, my son, because he's, you know, we are researchers, he's literally been in virtual reality since he was even, I mean, I have pictures of him in the little basket as a newborn inside a cave and things like that, you know. So so for him, it's just, it's just like a refrigerator. It's just there. So, so he doesn't wonder about it. He's not afraid of it. He's not curious about how it works. What he is curious is what happens in here. You know, his, his perspective is, you know, he gets into a virtual environment and he just wants to do things in there. 
he doesn't think about how difficult it is or how uncomfortable the gear is. You know, he is immediately mentally there and he just wants to be there. And then he starts asking a lot of interesting questions because he wants to do things that he cannot do. And for him, that doesn't have any logic. Because again, he's mentally there. So he has an, in his mind, he has a, 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 a concept of how this thing needs to respond to him and it's not responding to him. So sometimes he gets frustrated. He's the first one who meets the uh, limitations. Yeah, because, because his mind is, is, is way beyond my mind, you know, so, but he, so, so when, when he sees my constraints implemented on, on the system, he gets frustrated because he wants to really go a there, but it's a there that I don't understand it yet, you know, because I'm still busy looking under the hood, you know. So I think for me, the fact that, that um, I think in our case, we're very fortunate because it's the whole family, <laughs> because my husband is part of the, the same research that I do, you know, and now our son pretty much lives with us in the, in the lab whenever he's not in school, you know, so, so we have an interesting perspective on, on doing this. And, and in some cases, like I say, he, our little son sometimes opens our minds just because we see his frustrations because he expects some things that are not happening, but we didn't even think about them because we were too busy tinkering, you know, so, so this is, as, as he's getting a little older, I think it's going to be, if, if he continues being interesting, because, you know, who knows what he's going to develop in as he grows up, but I think it's going to be interesting to see his unrestricted mind. And, and like you mentioned earlier, you know, he might develop different identities that I'm not thinking about, you know, but he might decide that. You know, we just got some recent equipment in our laboratory and he mastered that equipment before any of our graduate students. And watching him using that particular equipment, it was absolutely amazing. The students got the technology, look around, and couldn't think of anything to do with it. He could have spent hours, days, doing things with it. And, and, and we were like, where did he learn to do that? You know, it's amazing. It's just amazing to see that. So I think we have those, those different generations and, and it's very, very um, interesting, you know, because again, I have my older parents too and watching them sometimes, their reaction is the total opposite. You know, they, they are the most constrained because they, they don't even want to move because they feel they're going to break something or, or, or they're not sure what to expect, you know, where then the little ones, they're somewhere else that we don't even know where they are yet. So that's amazing. That sounds beautiful. I'm looking forward to seeing it, playing with the things, or playing, it's not even playing. It's, uh, yeah, really. it's yet, uh, you know, and, uh, and his playing says to other, he travels with us sometimes when we do professional events and, and he actually is in the booth doing demos. And it's really, really fun watching him explaining his interpretation of our work. It's just really amazing. Um, because in, in most cases, he just observes a little bit what the graduate students are doing, and then he just takes it to a completely different level immediately. Not technically, I mean, he doesn't even know how to read, but, but it's just, again, his, his mind is somewhere else that I cannot go there. I'm too constrained with my own knowledge of the technology to, to let me go there, where he doesn't care. Is it reading an, an, an old, old reality? I don't, what? Is reading an old reality? What do you mean by that? Well, that he, he, he cannot even read, but he doesn't he oh. need to read. To be able to oh, read. no, he, no, he, no, no, he's... Why should you read? He doesn't need, no, he just... You know, again, he, he's, he, and not only he, I mean, we, we talk about my son because of course we see him all the time, but when he brings uh, his little friends to the lab sometimes, you know, it's the same thing. I mean, they, they all, you know, they are little kindergartners, you know, and they, they again, they start doing things, uh, manipulating the, the space, uh, creating, 
you know, their own worlds in there um, with a freedom that we don't have, you know. And again, they don't know how to read. They don't know how to write yet. They're learning that in kindergarten. But it's not about that. It's, it's about their mental understanding of the world or something, you know. Um, you know, they, they grew up with these, with iPads, with all those things, you know. Uh, so for them, it's just as normal as a refrigerator in the house, you know. So is, is that what he is developing in other people, uh, children from his age? Can you call that like a mind of the universe? Um, it certainly will be the mind of the universe for the future, of course, because, I mean, every every generation is a new mindset on 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 not only technology, but just humanity and, and the world, you know. So, so, yeah, I mean, these are the new minds of the new universe. Because the new universe is not going to be only the universe as we know it today with the planets and the galaxies and all the beautiful formations. It's a completely limitless universe because it's going to come out of our imagination. So it's new minds, absolutely. <laughs> what? <laughs> I, I, I was thinking, because it's, it's beautiful, because a new universe is coming from our imagination. Yes. That's what you said. That's what I said. The new, the new universe is, is, it doesn't have physical constraints. Because, again, we can create it in the computer. The, the real universe still will be there. And all the real problems like pollution, global warming, crime, social status, of course, those are going to be there. And that's outside my expertise to... To but prepare the world for it, but can but, you imagine that we will come at a point that we won't recognize the virtual world anymore as a virtual one? We might get to the point. I think we will get to the point. Not on my generation, but I. But we are getting to the point because again, we go back which to what point? I was. Which point? Where we don't know the difference between real and virtual because we go back to my earlier comment. There is people that differentiate between virtual reality and augmented reality, and I don't. I think it's in a sense the same because the the virtual reality in the computer with augmented reality you can blend it into the real world. So so that's really for me where the future is, where virtual reality and augmented reality converge, because now your real reality and your virtual reality are intermingled and not differentiated from each other. So, so again, we can be looking out that window, and I know I'm looking at the river, but through augmented reality, I might see, I don't know, some mythical dragon flying by instead of the birds. It's my reality, because I want to see dragons flying around in, through my window. So I still see the river. I see the same things you see. I see the real trees. I see... The barge is coming down the river, but I have my dragons flying around. That's my reality. And what, what is left? Uh, if we have a, a real identity, physical identity, we have a virtual identity, uh, what is the common common thing we, we, we keep uh, uh, un, untouched? Is that the mind or is that uh, the instinct? Or what, what is it? What is it that... that which 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 uh, makes us us, us. With all our identities. <laughs> I, I don't know. I think the definition of us, you know, again changes through history, um, and and again we are on that changing uh, time in but history. I mean, what, so what is what is the, what is the thing that that that, that uh, what makes me me? Yeah, <laughs> and and you with with different identities, but it's still you. Well, you know, uh, I think what's going to make me is based on whatever situation I want to be me. You know, I, I don't think I might not be just one me. I might be multiple me's and that defines me. I don't know. You know, the, the, the essence, you know, is my change of what we think as individuals, because again, you can be different things. You can be in different places. You can. But it's also it's always one person or one me who, who, who chooses to go to different identities. Or do you mean that your me also 
um, develops different personalities. Yes. Oh, yeah. It becomes. <laughs> yeah. You. You. I, again, the, there is. There is. Uh, you know. We might get into the realm of almost multiple personalities or something like that. You know. But there is. You know. Uh, might be a dominant personality or dominant individual that does the one, you know, the, I think I think perhaps a way to look at it is we might have a choice. I mean, right now we don't have a choice. Me is me. It's this one. Whether I like it or not, this yeah, is... you make the choice. You this is the one. Choice. You make the choice. You make the choice of maybe a choice for other personalities. But it's still you who make the choice. That, 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 isn't yeah. there something which you could, like a DNA or something? I don't think DNA works in virtual reality, so I don't think so. I think it might be, yes, maybe... Is there nothing unique then? Because if, if, if everybody can choose all kinds of uh, identities or personalities, then, then people will become like each other. And what's the difference between all these people with different identities and personalities? There must be something unique. Yeah, but I guess, like so I said... Save us. <laughs> I think that there's probably gonna be that person that 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 individual that maybe is the I don't know we might end up having some supreme individual that is our main character that we decide this is this is the boss of all my individuals representations and this is the one that makes all the decisions I don't know like I said to me it's hard to envision that at this moment because there are um, again, I feel I'm a little bit constrained on what I know I can do. And I would like to know which personality <laughs> I can trust. Yeah, but again, I go back to what we have today with the with the situations with social media. You know, th there are there are many there are potentially many me's out there. You know, because many of us maybe we have one social media. Uh, persona, but there are people that have multiple social media personas in there, you know, and, you know, I might be talking to you on my social media persona where I'm some young teenager boy that goes surfing, you know, and you have no way to know you're talking with a 50-something-year-old woman, you know, but behind all those personas, I'm still me making, being that supreme me, making the decision, okay, I have this but multiple. I, 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 I don't know. I would like to know what what uh, 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 <laughs> you're trying to make me be very philosophical, and I'm not philosophical. <laughs> I'm not philosophical as well. I, 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 I like I like to think about it because if I cannot trust one of my identities, <clears throat> I get lost. Yeah, but you no, know what I mean, right? I know what you mean, but I think you can trust your identities. Because you are building those identities. The problem is with the other people can trust your identities. You know, you are building those identities. So I don't see any issues on, on you or me trusting my identities because I'm defining those. I'm building those. I'm making those happening. So I don't think I'll have any issues. You know, again, I can be a lobster and I totally trust myself as a lobster. Now, uh, you know, would you trust me as a lobster? That's, that would be a big question, you know. So, so I think it's more, and again, going back to the simpler situation with social media, it's the same thing. Do you trust that person that you're meeting through social media? You don't, because you really don't know who that person is. You, you see what the postings are, what the blogs are, what the maybe fake pictures that person is putting in there. Now, that person is trusting himself or herself because they are building that, but the, the problem is not so much us is going to be them, the others, you know, and, and yes, there is, again, there is a... How do you know if, uh, if a, another virtual reality is a real one? We might reach a point where we don't, and again, science fiction has already discussed this heavily in a lot of different books, you know, where, where you get into these alternate realities, these alternate universes, and you get to a point that you don't know which one is the real one anymore, and which one is a dream, and which one is real, and and potentially we can get into that direction again, not in the very short term, but in the very long term. Potentially we can go that way. Will we get there? I don't know. 
we would probably neither you or me would be alive by then <laughs> at that time. But there is there is now that yes, then maybe we can create some of us on personas that stays even though we are physically no longer here. And again, that's a possibility. That's a completely well, now, feasible. What, what are you saying now? And that's the last question. Because I'm saying, uh, are we going to be immortal in virtual reality? Maybe we are, you know, I don't know. Same as through robotics. People are starting to develop robots that you can transfer your mind to the robot. So our physical body might be gone, but maybe many years from now, we might continue living on through a robotic uh, replica of ourselves, who knows, you know, so, so all these things are out there for our imaginations to really explode, I guess. <laughs> well, it's up to your son. I think there is going to be a lot more people out there than my son trying to figure this out. <laughs> but again, for us, uh, for me, it's just been fun. It's been, um, uh, an amazing career, I guess, you know, or life or way of living that I have. Uh, and it was not chosen. Some people choose their path. Mine was not chosen. Mass was totally random. I came from here and I'm from there and from there. And I landed into this virtual reality thing without even knowing what I landed. And, you know, I just enjoy it tremendously, but it was not a plan path. Like I have some students that come with a very plan path to do this I it just happened you know and it's been it's been fun and 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 it's fun to be able to open the door and see what happens to the next the next generations that don't have those constraints where their their imagination really can fly free and and that's and, and that is when real progress is going to happen right now we're just starting and we are again, sometimes constraints from our own, our own knowledge today constraints sometimes so we can think. And the new generations that that knowledge is a matter of fact, is not a discovery anymore, then they can take it to the next level, same as we did from the previous generations from us. Clear, very clear. It's very practical. I'm very, <laughs> yeah. I'm very practical, I'm not a, I guess I don't philosophize very much. <laughs> but, well, I, I like it. I like the way we philosophize, but, but <laughs> very much because, uh, well, that's what people who watch this program also think about. What does it mean in the future, or what could it be? Or what, what, uh, I, I think it's interesting to raise a lot of questions without yeah. answering them because we, we, yeah. all, we will know in the future. Well, I think that fundamentally, the, what makes virtual reality to me an exciting science is that there are no physical rules limiting what we can do. Again, if we go back to the example of a biologist or something like that, that is trying to find a cure for a disease, his or her creativity is bound by the laws of physics. No matter what, how many ideas they can have, at the end of the day, it has to have some sort of molecular bonding, protein, something, virus, whatever, DNA, something. It has very clear rules of behavior. The nice thing about virtual reality is we don't have that. Like I said earlier, the limit is what we can imagine, what we can think. We have no physical constraints. The physical world does not constrain what we can do in the virtual reality. In, in what sense is what you do uh, magic? It's magic because, again, I am not bound by the laws of physics. So why, I, why, why is it magic? I don't understand. What is magic? Because here, if I want to walk on the ceiling, I can't. Because gravity is going to make me fall. In virtual reality, nothing prevents me from starting walking out the wall and walking up the ceiling. So now that is magic. In the future, it's not magic it might be a matter of fact, you know. Um, it's magic because, for example, I'm here with you right now, and in two seconds, I can be in China. That's poof, magic, you know, like, like you. We Do put, your parents understand that? I don't know. You can ask my father about it. 
<laughs> I think that they are starting more and more. When when I started doing this uh, many many years ago, they were very um, worried and skeptical that I was doing something that was worth anything. Because of course, when I started, it was the tinker, the really tinkering time. So I was totally covered from head to toe in cables and hanging myself in a scaffolding and a screwdrivers on my hands all the time, you know. So. Um, but I think over the years, they've seen a lot of the experiences that we have built. Uh, they've seen um, how the work that I do has been spread out in a lot of industry, in a lot of different parts of society. And I think they are trying to understand it better. Again, the, their, their, um, their perspective is always like, for them, it's truly magic. I have no idea how you do this, honey, but it looks great. <laughs> you know, so for them, it's truly, truly magic. You know, um, for me, it's, again, it's, it's magic in that sense that you can just, in a split second, be somewhere else. And again, that somewhere else could be real, a, a, a reconstruction of a real place or a completely imagination place and and you can see uh sometimes again on the on the little ones you can um uh, you can hear my son sometimes saying that's like this is magic i'm doing magic you know because he does something and presses a button or shakes his hands or something and something else happens and of course in real life it's impossible to do so it is magic and it's magical because it just uh enchants people you know, people get, you know, when you go to Disney World, it's just the magical place. When people go to virtual reality, it's the same feeling. It's this enchantment, like, oh, this is really cool. Oh, this is really nice. It's fun. And, and, and suppose if we discontinue this development with all virtual identities, and uh, uh, is it also possible that, because now it's magic, but in the future won't be magic anymore? Is it possible that we create our own virtual um, god? Oh. <laughs> Will um. there always be something in, in our, uh, us, in us humans with, uh, who, that we want to create some kind of creature? All, almighty them? being. Maybe. I'm not very religious, so I don't know, but maybe. You know, I mean, it's it's all what everybody individually can believe, you know, and uh, like I say, I don't, I don't believe that if I step all my virtual balcony, I'm going to fall down the cliff, you know, but there are many people that come and they cannot take that step, you know. But all, all, the, all humans together, they create a God which nobody can see, but it's there. Because we believe that then it's there. So if all the virtual identities uh, uh, also um, create something which they cannot see or touch, but they believe in, I don't know. I think I think that I'm very skeptical about that because you know it's still it's digital. It's in the computer. It's what, 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 in, in man made. What will, what will be different between us and? The, Digital. Yeah, I think I think for something I like that, for something like that, you are talking. I think it might have to be. You know, if, if you look in the history, you know, every time there is a new religion or a new god or something, something very drastic happened in human history that this new god appears. You know, so so might be a possibility. If, again, some massive drastic, who knows what happens in human history that suddenly. The digital world supersedes the physical world in some manner, and then at that point, maybe there should be maybe some new groups of people that start creating this, you know, almighty being that is never seen or something. But I think with the world as we know it today, I don't see that happening unless again some major something happens to humanity that. They need to believe on something new, which is what really, you look at the history of religion, that's really what happens. The, the new gods come out when something else happens, and, and there is something else that people need to hold on to. As, as we are right now, I, I don't think that will happen. I mean, 
But but you you said something that uh, uh, I I remembered uh, uh, because I was just wondering um, our reality right now. Who says that is not a digital reality as well? Or yes. Some virtual. We can, we, for all we know, we can be some computers that somebody else built that we are just enjoying a little bit of battery life, you know, yes, yes, of course, of course, you know, and, and then we get into the argument, you know, do you believe in a Christian God or do you believe on a Buddhist God or are you completely an atheist and, and all those kinds of things, you know, um, I think that's more individual, uh, beliefs my my family is traditionally a catholic family so so we i guess believe that we are humans and this is the real reality and hopefully there will be some other <laughs> some other reality on our next virtual, stage in life <laughs> is virtual reality able to now and i don't have an answer for that i have no idea I think that again is going to be a very, very individualized uh, mindset for that, you know, uh, same as all the religions. There are some religions that are, to some people, feel very crazy, but they have a lot of followers. And, and some other religions, we are more comfortable and we are the followers or something, you know. So I think that's just part of human life, I guess, or part of humanity. Some, some of us believe on things and some of us don't believe on things. I don't think we all collectively will believe on just that one thing because that never happened. You never had the entire world believing on the same thing altogether. So I think in virtual reality, it might develop some cults, sects, communities, um, uh, parishes, whatever you want to call it, you know, maybe, you know, I mean, again, same as with religion, sometimes you will hear something on television, some preaching that happens, and you're like, hmm, I wonder how these people actually follow this, you know? And then sometimes you hear some others that you're like, oh, this is really, really good, you know? But maybe somebody else thinks, oh, Carolina, you are crazy. How can you believe on that, you know? I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> we'll wait for the future to happen. <laughs>